Mm. Hi there, guys. It's Archie. I'm back for the ADHD Care podcast. I have a special guest, Megan Brown, who's joining me virtually today to discuss all things ADHD in the workplace. Uh, Megan is an uh, um, ADHD coach and also the founder of ADHD at Work. So I know some of you have been sending me questions uh, regarding this topic today. So um, I'll be posing some of those questions to Megan, uh, who I'm literally about to bring on to this platform. Hello. Hey, um, sorry. I also double booked myself, of course, in the very ADHD way. <laughs> um, Did you? <laughs> and so I had to, I was just signing out of a class that I'm in. All right. How are you? <laughs> no, no, yeah, I'm good. Thanks. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Yeah, it's been a while. So we saw each other obviously at the ADHD conference in Baltimore, like a few couple of months ago. Yeah, and yeah, at the end of yeah. When was that? November, end of November. That was November time. Yeah. So and yeah, so and I know we've been chatting on email and stuff. Um, wanted to bring it on to discuss all things ADHD in the workplace. So yeah, yeah. I'm excited. Yeah, I'm, I, I still can't believe that I actually went to that conference. But <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> with shall we? Shall we just tell our listeners? You also had your baby there with you, didn't you? Yes, I was at this conference, and I was like, I don't know, eight weeks, maybe six weeks postpartum. Crazy. I don't know what I was. Wow. Thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very, your husband uh, was there. He was there, which was extremely hopeful. I definitely would not have been able to make it if he was not there. Yeah, yeah. Just, just, just to make it clear to our listeners, they're probably thinking like an eight-week-old baby was coming into the seminars and the meetings oh, and things. Definitely no, no. not. <laughs> definitely not. He was not around all the extra people. No, no, absolutely. So, um, yeah, so... I hope the you know baby's doing well, um, and um, yeah, I hope you're well as well. I hope you had a great Christmas and New Year. I did. Um, the time has been flying by pretty quickly. The little baby is um, a little over three months now, so he, um, you know, he is meeting all his milestones and talking a lot. Well, like you know, baby talk. Um, yeah, yeah. And yeah. so, yeah, I've just been, um, you know, and trying to enjoy family time, um, and also work on supporting my clients. Absolutely. So I've just done an introduction about you there just now before you came on, um, just talking about your work, um, supporting, you, you support just individuals because I know on your website, it talks about women, workplace. It's not just women you support, is it? You support? Yeah, so everyone. Um, I think my one-on-one -on -one clients are all women. And so I've been supporting women okay. with ADHD. Um, however, right. um, with some of the corporate clients, then um, it's both women and well, all genders, however you identify. Right. Okay. Fair enough. Um, so I thought today we could discuss about, well, let's start with your journey first, and then we okay. talk about ADHD in, in the workplace. So so you you have a diagnosis of ADHD yourself, haven't you? I do. Yes. Do you want to tell us about that moment when you realized uh, that you may have ADHD? So before you actually went for the assessment, how did that happen? What was it that re made you realize that you might benefit from being assessed for, for ADHD? Sorry, yeah, so, so the crazy part sorry, is, is that I, um, you know, social media, right? And so I was on social media scrolling like I normally do and um, I was following this woman who changed her platform to talk about ADHD and entrepreneurship. And so I'd always desired to be an entrepreneur. And so that's why I was following her in the first place. But then she started to share stories and her whole life sounded to, started to sound really familiar. Um, and so I started to dig and do some more research. And the funny thing at the time I was actually working for an early childhood special education program um, in the operations. And so, but I had to, I was working with it speech and language pathologist, occupational therapist, physical therapist, psychologist, all day, every day. Um, and, you know, our teams were evaluating kids for things like ADHD or autism or other areas of um, <clears throat> concerns with their development. And it never clicked to me 
that I actually had ADHD myself. And there was also some other staff that had reported that they had ADHD and it still just never clicked. And then once I started to really better understand like how ADHD impacts your day to day, that's when I started to realize and question like, hmm, maybe I should just go ahead and get tested. Um, and so, you know, I feel honored and blessed and, you know, privileged because in DC it's, I live in Washington, DC. So it's, um, it was really an easy process with my health insurance to be able to get diagnosed. And so once I did, that's when, you know, I started to dig down this rabbit hole um, in a very ADHD way. Um, and so now here I am running a business, supporting other people with ADHD as well and advocating for them on their behalf. Wow. Um, how old were you, if you don't mind me asking, when you got the diagnosis? Um, 38. Yeah, okay. I know I don't currently look 38, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't at all. <laughs> but I'm now officially <laughs> over 38. Um, but right. when I was diagnosed, I was 38 at the time. <laughs> okay, fair enough. So what's been your journey post-diagnosis then when you finally got the diagnosis? And how, how, did that make sense to you? Did you kind of go, well, you know, this is a new <laughs> chapter for me. Um, and then what, what was that like? What was your journey after that? It did. And, and the funny thing is, is like, I was also um, engaged at the time or about to be engaged at the time. And so with my current husband, and so I, you know, I was finding this out the same time that he was finding this out. And um, so we yeah. went down the journey together also. And so, you know, he did his own research, which was, um, you know, made me realize why I love him and why this relationship is going to work. <laughs> um, he did his, he did his own research and came, he came back with me with, bought books about ADHD and ADHD and relationships. And so he was able to also provide me a lot of different resources to better understand myself. And so, you know, that's the, that's the blessing about having a really good partner. And so I didn't have to walk down this ADHD road by myself, which was really helpful. And then once I really started to dig into it, then, um, I started to talk about it a little bit more in my workplace. And at that point I was at my job for over 12 years. And so talking about ADHD with my colleagues was nothing because we were all friends pretty much. And so, um, but then they also revealed to me that they had ADHD and I was so shocked because I had known them for so long and nobody said anything and no. And then at the same time, they also said, yeah, you definitely have ADHD. And I'm like, I'm like, I recognize that we're colleagues, but we're also friends. And it would have been nice if you would have said something. <laughs> um, but it says a lot about, you know, disclosing within the workplace and people not really feeling comfortable with their own selves and their own diagnosis of ADHD to be able to talk about it freely. So the, the um, it's, it's interesting that your colleagues picked that up and... <laughs> they were suspecting, oh yeah, she might have ADHD, which is what most people tend to do. And then you disclose and you go, I've got ADHD. And they go, yeah, we, we all knew that. <laughs> Isn't it? It's right. like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they all knew uh, that. And it's like, oh yeah, me too. And I also have it. Yeah. And I'm okay. like, really? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, and then we fast forward from there. How how life-changing has it been since you got the diagnosis? Do you obviously understand yourself more? And as no, you mentioned I your husband a few times, as well what was that like for him um i mean i feel like he's right upstairs i should ask him but he um you know it's been a journey together i think when he was reading the initially he was reading the book about adhd and adhd and relationships he was able to underline and highlight and flag all of the things and he his first comment was like this is a manual like this is a megan manual um and so then when i went back and i started to read you know because i I never, I guess it's rare that I read a book from the beginning to the end, um, but like from the front to the back cover, I usually like skip around unless it's the story. But, um, and so I was looking at all the different areas that he highlighted and underlined and flagged. And I was like, oh my God, you're absolutely correct. This is the manual to me. Um, and so yeah. it's interesting reading about yourself in a book that you didn't write. Hmm. Um, so it was a very reflective, reflective process from there. And I think, um, you know, and once I started to talk about it a little bit more at work and um, and really try and talking with my colleagues who also had ADHD, which was also nice to be able to, you know, as I was going through the journey of myself and trying to figure out like, how is this impacting me and how is this impacting me in the workplace? It was nice to be able to have colleagues to talk to 
um, so I could see like what their journey was, how they're navigating it and be able to have some direct sources to, to talk to um, other than, you know, medical professionals, um, but somebody yeah. on the ground, like being able to yeah. figure out how to access this community. Um, and because that was my next step, it's like, okay, let me figure out how to access supports. Yeah. Uh, like what is quote unquote treatment look like? Or like, how do you, how do you manage the, the day to day? Because after reflecting, I'm, I was realizing that I was burnt out. I was completely mm. burnt out at my job and I didn't know why. I didn't know why I was sitting in the car for 20 minutes before I walked inside. Um, I didn't know why I was sitting at the desk and anticipating being interrupted and not being able to go back to the task that I was at after I was interrupted. Like I didn't, I didn't understand why I was having those challenges until I was, until I was diagnosed. But then, you know, after that, I was like, okay, I need a new job. Like I, right. I've been here long enough. Um, I love y'all and I love the work that you're doing. And I will always, you know, support the work that is happening within that company that I was working for. I was like, but I gotta go. Like I need to be able to pri prioritize my own health. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I went through a whole journey of trying to heal from burnout. Um, and so, and now here yeah. I am. <laughs> well, yeah, now which, here I am being which, a mom. So like, I don't know if that's really me. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's another challenge as well. Um, and, and and certainly having a supportive husband, as you referred to him, to him there, that's been obviously quite helpful as well throughout that whole journey. As you again, you you mentioned that you you were about to get engaged at that time, and 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 certainly him understanding you and being able to kind of go through the process with you as well. It must have been. Uh, did what, did he have to input into the assessment at all? Did they ask him to fill out some rating scales, questionnaires? Your husband him, no. at that stage. No, no, no. Okay. No, All right. Um, no, I would no, they asked I had to fill out a questionnaire and then I took um I, I went to a facility to take some tests, some computerized tests. And then oh, okay. I also um had to fill out a questionnaire to have my mom answer some questions um right. about my childhood. Um, yeah, you know, some people still believe like ADHD. Some people with ADHD, it's like, oh, I had this as a kid. I don't have this as an adult. And it's like, mm, that's not how it works. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then moving on from there, you then set up your own business, which is the ADHD at work. Yes. Um, yeah. So how did that come about? Um, so I wanted to combine. So when I was at the other position, I was in operations. And so I did everything from marketing communications. I did HR work. I did facilities work. I did program design, program evaluation. Um, and <clears throat> we opened up new facilities and whatnot. And so it was a lot. And so I decided that I wanted to narrow down my area of focus to HR. Um, Cause my background was originally in, as I had my master's in social work. And so I did macro social work and I did program development and leadership development. And so that's why I was in, I was just helping to support the design of an implementation of a program. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, I really wanted to focus on the HR part, because I really enjoyed the people part. I enjoyed the recruitment. I enjoyed the hiring. I enjoyed the onboarding. I enjoyed the organizational culture building type work. And so I went and later got a uh, certification in HR. And then, so when I left all of this, when I left this space, I was like, okay, how can I combine my areas of interest and, um, my passions and my skill sets to help support a community that I now feel obligated to support. And so I started to combine the workplace and ADHD in one, um, in one space. Um, and I'm coming from the perspective of, you know, I don't believe that there's anything about the person with ADHD that needs to be fixed. Um, but I do believe that there's um, there's a lot of different structures around us that need to be fixed in order to best support the ADHD. -er. Um, but I but you know, in a perfect world, everybody would be inclusive, right? All environments would be yeah. inclusive. The reality is, it's not like all environments yeah. would understand that there isn't one type of person in the workplace, and that they would support the neurodiverse workplace that that actually exists. Um, but it doesn't. And so we have to, there are ways in which the ADHD -er has to adjust to the world that doesn't, that isn't designed for them, but also the world that's not designed for them needs to change. And yeah. um, so I try to work from both angles. And so helping to support 
the ADHD or navigate what's really in front of them, but then also helping them um, being advocates for themselves to help shift the environment around them, but then also like, you know, work with organizations to help them better understand what it means to have a more inclusive space. Yeah. Um, what, what advice would you give to anyone with ADHD um, about disclosing their diagnosis to in the workplace? So there's um, a lot of advice, actually. And so, um, you know, I'm having, I'm actually creating, a, I'm drafting an ebook right now around some questions that you should ask yourself prior to um, disclosing, disclosing at work. And this is across, you know, one is know what your rights are. And those rights are going to look a little different depending on where you live. I'm in the United States. And so we have ADA. The UK has other laws. Australia has other laws. You know, different countries have different laws around that. And so we need, it's important for you to better understand what your rights are. Um, the other thing is, do you really have a comprehensive understanding of your ADHD? And, you know, you're not going to know everything, right? But you do need to know some basics around how, what your executive function strengths and weaknesses are and how they are actually impacting your day-to-day -day, um, and how they're impacting your work. And, you know, that leads to the next question is when you say my work, do you actually know what your work is? And so <laughs> do you know yeah, what you're supposed yeah. to be doing? Like, do you know what your essential functions are versus your non-essential functions are? And because, um, you know, everybody applies to these jobs, right? And then you start, then you hire and you're in there three weeks and then all of a sudden you're doing something else that you weren't hired for. And, yeah. you know, that's around like, you know, having a conversation with your manager and other people within your office about like, what am I actually supposed to be doing? What are the skills that are needed in order to get this work done? And then how does my ADHD impact all of that? Um, but, and then, you know, before all of that, you also need to, you need to know or ask yourself, do you feel like you're a strong advocate for yourself? And do you have the skills that you need in order to be an advocate for yourself? Um, and um, so, you know, once, and, you know, that's a sneak peek of the ebook, but the, the um, you know, the, the foundation of it is, do you know who you are? Do you know where you're working? Do you know how all of those things connect? And yeah. are you willing to speak up? And yeah. if, you're not, be, be if you're not willing to speak up, then that's like a, that's yeah. a joke of itself um, but if you don't know what you're doing and how and who you are and how everything connects and impacts each other then it's going to be harder to in order to get the things that you need at the works in the workplace and if you are that person that isn't able to speak up for themselves or being an advocate for themselves what would you advise in terms of like you know what what steps can they take can they approach someone else that can then maybe speak to the employer on their behalf or uh, what, what, yeah what steps would they take in that situation um so you know around like being comf comfortable enough yeah like, I mean, okay yeah so you know you know advocacy requires you to be comfortable within your own with your own skill like self and your own skin right and so um is there somebody within your workplace that you do trust in order to disclose, like, do you need a buddy? Like, do you need somebody to help support you through that process? Do you need to talk to somebody outside of work in order to talk and to be able to be comfortable enough to be able to advocate for your needs? You know, sometimes you have to start small. Like, have you advocated for your needs within your own household? Have you advocated for your needs with your friendships? And so leaning on some of the skills that you probably already have, because I'm sure at some point you've had to advocate for your needs, um, and then use those same skill sets in the workplace. Um, yeah. We, we talk a lot about creating an ADHD office friendly environment. <laughs> Do you want to break it down to us what that means? What is an office friendly uh, ADHD environment? Yeah. So, you know, in, in the office space, it can, it starts a lot with the organizational culture. And so when we talk about like, what is your, what is the culture of your organization? Like, do you value inclusivity and diversity? And not just do you say it, but do you actually live it and practice it on a regular basis. And that's everything from the beginning to the end of the hiring process to once you get, um, once you start working there as well. Um, so it's like, you know, it, it's embracing a culture of inclusivity. And so that's, first and foremost. Um, and then other aspects of organizational culture are just the way that you operate as a business 
do you support open and supportive communication? Are you creating environments that allow people to feel safe enough to communicate their needs and, and safe mm -hmm. enough to be say like, oh, I actually need some accommodations um, without feeling shame or without being shamed. Um, being yeah. shamed and feeling shamed, like, and those may be two different things. Um, but, and so are you, are, so are you creating a psychologically safe environment? Are you creating an environment that is inclusive and diverse? And um, are you structuring your programming or your workday around some like flexibility and allowing some, um, yeah, allowing some flexible, like flexible arrangements, like within, within your workspace? And then are you also creating an environment that focuses on the strengths and abilities instead of weaknesses? Like, are you constantly putting people in a position where they have to, um, they're, they're being stretched or they're like, you have to fix all of these things. You have to fix all these weaknesses. Or are you allowing people to honor and work in their areas of strength? Or do you even know what those are of your employees? Yeah. So, so, so these questions are, this is what you'd be asking the employer, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And I suppose, yeah. yeah, every, some of the things you mentioned, obviously it's very personal to every individual, isn't it? So not yeah. everyone would require, you know, certain things or things to be put in place, but overall, I think you've just given us an overview of like something, some of the things that they need to be more mindful of when they're trying to, you know, to be more neurodiverse friendly, particularly when they have employers that have ADHD in this case. Correct. And also, are you training your managers? Like, are you training people? Like, people do, even, do your people even know anything about ADHD or neurodiverse, yeah. neurodiversity in general or like how yeah. things work in general in order to function differently? So like, are you, what are you basing your management and leadership styles from? Um are you looking at neuro leadership? Like there's a neuro leadership Institute. Like it's really thinking about like leadership from the brain perspective. Um, and so are you training your managers? Are you providing the opportunity for your managers to access training, to get additional support, to best support their neurodiverse employees? Um, Cause I know you used to have some managers. It's like you have disclosed that work. You have access to accommodations. You're, you're, you're getting access to things that you have the rights to under the law in your country, but then you are working with a manager that refuses to implement anything like, and so then, then you have a, a clash, right? And so then you have managers that are not following the law and, but you also have managers that are not supporting your, their, their team members. And how do you yeah. deal with that as an organization? Like what systems do you have in place to, to work with managers that are not abiding by the rules and regulations and just being a supportive partner in the work for their employees? And if there are employers listening to this podcast right now, um, in addition to what you just said there, is there anything else that you would want them to maybe consider or think about certainly just from a neurodiverse point of view i would want managers and other leaders to be open and supportive but also aware enough to understand what they do impacts the person with adhd and so if you know if you're not meeting with them regularly if you're not setting up check-ins if you're not um, or if you're constantly berating people, um, you're going to have a negative effect on the ADHD. -er. If you're constantly, um, you know, giving them last minutes, last minute assignments, and not giving them all the details that they need in order to complete the task, um, like the person is different than you, and so you have to you have to work with the person and not just do what worked best for you. That's not always going to work. And even if you're a manager with ADHD, like that's a whole other thing. That's a whole other conversation. Yeah, yeah that's true. <laughs> um, but, one, that true. <laughs> but, you know, at the end of the day, it's like you have to really understand your impact on somebody else. Mm. And do you understand your impact on that other person that you're having on a regular basis? Because, you know, I think it's some, um, I posted something on my LinkedIn. I can't remember the statistic off the top of my head, but it's it's about like because managers 
are interacting with employees more than people that are interacting with their partners or interacting with their doctors, that managers have a greater influence on their mental health than other people in their lives. And you need to know that. You need to know that yeah. as a manager or a leader that you're impacting somebody's mental health by yeah. your actions. And if you have, if you're working with somebody that has ADHD, you need to be aware of that. It's, it's that self-awareness, isn't it? You're talking about there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Self-awareness. And that's, you know, that's part of, you know, that's part of the model that I use when I work with my clients with ADHD too. So, you know, I, they're all start with A's because, you know, A's are. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And so, you know, when I work with my clients, I really help try to them like as increase their awareness of their ADHD, like how is their ADHD impacting their worlds? Then it's also acceptance and helping people support, helping people better accept the fact that they have ADHD. Like you have ADHD, like let's not for, like, forget that. Like I know we have working memory challenges, but at the end of the day, like you have ADHD and yeah. uh, acceptance is part of that process. But then also, you know, in the workplace, what accommodations or strategies can you put in place in order to best support the brain that you do have um and then how do you put those how do you put those accommodations in in action steps and so those are my four a's when i work with my clients okay i'll get you to recap those four a's at the end as well um so you mentioned <laughs> a lot about accommodations there do you want to give us a, a, an example of some of the common uh, workplace accommodations that could be beneficial for individuals that have adhd so I'm always going to lean in with coaching, but coaching. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, if you can get access to coaching in your workplace, I would definitely make sure that you sign up and ask for that. Um, but if you can't, um, then there's definitely other things that you can do. Um, and it all depends kind of on what your work environment is, but then also what your, how your ADHD is impacting your particular work. So, you know, like you have on headphones, right? And so like, if you are in a open workspace that usually is never going to work, for somebody with ADHD, um, and, you know, I know here in the States, it's like this open floor plan model, like the work design is the new thing, right? But it, never, it does not work for a lot of people, actually. Yeah. And, yep. uh, <laughs> and so, you know, like, do you need headphones? Do you need to be able to go to access to a room that's quiet? Um, but part of it is about like having the flexibility to be able to do that. Um, do you have the flexibility? Do you have the flexibility to go somewhere else? Do you have, do you need noise canceling headphones? Do you need to set up um, some type of office arrangement so that you don't have random people walking in? Like that happens with leaders a lot, right? So like organizations have this open door policy, um, but having an open door policy may not work for somebody with ADHD when they're just sitting and anticipating somebody to walk in at every given time. <laughs> and then yeah. nobody <clears throat> walk in, but you're just sitting there anxious and like, you're just waiting for somebody to interrupt you. Um, yeah. And so like policies like that may need to shift. Um, there's actually a really good website. It's Jan, let me see what it is. It's just, um, I always forget what it is. It's askjan.org. And askjan.org will actually cover a really, uh, a ton of different work accommodations for depending on your executive function challenge. Um, but you can always go to that website and look up ADHD and it's, it covers all different areas of disability. So if you have other disabilities as well, like sometimes ADHD doesn't come by itself and um, you may have some other areas that you need some accommodation for and, and um, yeah. the job. Amazing. I've just, I've just made, made a note of that and I'll add it into the, into the podcast description as well. So it's askgen.org. Yeah, so John Combination Network, ask Jan. Yeah, mm -hmm. amazing, perfect. All right. Um, from a sort of legal perspective, really, uh, are you able to sort of shed some light in terms of the legal aspects of workplace accommodations for ADHD? Um, for the United States. Oh, yeah, of course, of course, um, yeah. <laughs> um, <if you laughs> well, listeners from other different countries that are listening to this podcast right now, then um, I am not. Yeah equipped with that that information however yeah. in the united states there's ada and so the ada um, and the american disabilities acts will allow you to be able to access accommodations in the workplace because they're all about making sure that people with disabilities are not being discriminated against 
Um, and so, you know, it covers a lot of different areas from everything from like your physical workspaces and city arrangements, as well as um, what you have access to in college versus what you have access to in the workplace. Um, but, you know, there's some rules around making sure that if you are asking for accommodations and you need to just, you, you do have to disclose at work in order to be able to access them. Um, but, but interestingly enough, you can start to ask for accommodations in the interview process, but in the interview process, you don't have to actually disclose, but you do have the right to ask for accommodations. Mm. So, yeah, and it, obviously in the UK, for anyone listening, we have the uh, Disability Discrimination Act. Um, and also there are other acts that we will listen to the podcast as well. But obviously our listeners are from everywhere across the world. Yeah. So yeah. we suggest that you look into your, where, wherever you're based, um, what legislations, policies are there in, 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 in the country where you are. Yeah, and um, I'm assuming that they're yeah, pretty similar across across yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, the UK also has access to more stuff than the United States does. Um, so, you know, sometimes I'm like... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's what I discovered when I was in that conference. There was things that I saw that we had here that we then moved over across to you guys over there in the States. So, yeah, we don't usually see that though, but it's yeah. But anyway, that's another topic for yeah, another day. Yeah, yeah, that's a very another. That's a whole other topic for another day. <laughs> a lot of different laws. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, productivity. So, uh, have you seen any kind of accommodations that impact on productivity and well-being in the workplace? Um, so, productivity is one of those areas that you you really need to better understand. Um, what is impacting your productivity. And so if it's distractibility that's impacting your productivity, then what are some accommodations that you can put in place to limit the distractibility? And so, you know, some people are in offices, like some people, you may have an office that's right next to an elevator, for instance. And so then like every two seconds, somebody is walking by, pushing the elevator button, you're hearing the dinging and dinging all day. This is like the accommodation would actually just be asked to be moved to a different part of the office. Um, and it could be, something as simple as simple as that um there's other like if you're working from home your what you're doing being distracted by may look a little different so like i know for me um i can speak from personal experience when it comes to being distracted even and you know because i work from home it's my off like my office is on the first floor of my home but it's not in a separate space and so like when other people are in the house, like my husband's home or there's other people here, I have to recognize that like maybe it's time for me to work somewhere else. And so like I need to put in my own accommodations um, for myself and say like, OK, well, this is going to be a busy household day. So then maybe I need to go and work another place um, or maybe I need to do some body doubling. Then there's whole thing about office organization. And so is what does your workspace look like? Is your workspace like scattered? Does it have a lot of stuff everywhere? Are you are you being distracted by your actual physical environment, work environment? And so is there an opportunity to take some time to clean and organize? Can you access resources within your work environment in order to um get supports to organize your space? Is there somebody that specializes in organizational design within your office space that you can ask to consult with in order to be able to come in and put it together in a way that is not gonna cause a lot of distractions? Um, then there's there's other things like, you know, if it's work, if you're working memory is a challenge that's impacting your productivity, how can you create visual reminders to help support you as you're working on your project? Your, your different projects. And that could be different apps that you're using. Like, do you, are you using a, um, a, a project management tool that can send you emails or send you reminders to help keep you on task? Do you have visual reminders in front of you so that you don't, that you don't forget? And so, you know, when you think about productive productivity, you need to think about what's actually interrupting yeah. your ability to be productive. If you think back to your previous employment before you became self-employed, um, if you were to go back to that same employer in, in, um, uh, employment with your diagnosis of ADHD, what would you want to see different without really kind of <laughs> pinpointing oh too much? 
I would do something. <laughs> <different. laughs> um, um, one, yeah. I would be very clear about what my job description is actually supposed to be. Right. And, yeah. Um, and limit those duties to be and to and so that my capacity is not being maxed out. Um, you know, and I was in an educational Sunday, and I know I work with some other educators that um, have ADHD as well. And, you know, just the culture of education is, they just, it will work you to death in, if you allow it. And so, um, you know, ADHD is a very creative and very innovative, and we have a lot of ideas. And I had tons of ideas. And, um, well, you know, and it's nice because, you know, it can come across as like, oh, well, I'm supporting your innovative thinking. But at the same time, it's like, I actually, this is a really good idea. And I recognize this is a really good idea, but I also don't have like the capacity in order to implement this idea. And you needed a manager that would say no, or like not now. Yeah. Um, um, and, you know, making sure that I had regular check-ins and we really went through my work and was very clear about the expectations and the goals. Um, I would also have vetoed the open door policy <laughs> um, as well because yeah. it did not work for me. Hmm. Um, yeah. Also, very little things like making sure that I had appropriate technology, that I wasn't working on a laptop all of the time, but I actually had access to a larger screen in addition to like two screens. It's, it's things like that to be able to better organize my my visuals so that I could be more productive and not get distracted by the um, million tabs that I have open in one, in one small window. Yeah. Makes sense. So one yeah. of the things that you said there, that's something I, I often hear from people that um, in workplaces, some of them not diagnosed, some of them with the diagnosis of ADHD. Um, coming back to you in terms of your own journey with the, your ADHD, have you discovered any strengths or hidden talents that you have that might probably be linked with your uh, ADHD or untapped talents, maybe? Yeah, I realized that I was the my my ability to be super creative um, is definitely ADHD, and also my passion for um, social justice is also very ADHD, and yeah. um, and I also realized that. I'm really good at listening um, to people, believe it or not, which is weird because like, you know, with ADHD, sometimes you're like not actually really listening, but I yeah. also have training. So that may have something to do with it because of my social work background and that active listening is actually a strength of mine. Being able to actively listen to people um, is a strength and then being able to really identify the strengths in other people is a strength of mine. I can see what other people can't see in themselves. Yeah. Excellent. So, yeah, <laughs> uh, I can see why you became a coach in the end and also setting up what you set up and, you know, the advocacy part of you in terms of, you know, workplace accommodations and all of that. Um, what are some of the challenges that uh, some of your clients come to you uh, wanting some support around just in general, just in terms of coaching? What some of the themes that usually come up? Um, time management challenges usually come up and um, ca capacity usually comes up. Um, and then also some challenges around the impact the work environment is having on them. Um, and a lot of it also has to do with like time management and um, capacity. Those those come up a lot actually. And like like, there's just not enough time in the day. Like, how do I get all this stuff done? And recognizing like one, your list is probably too long in the first place and a little unrealistic. And so, you know, stepping back to take a look at what is actually on your to-do list. And then did you put too much stuff on it? Well, your today list is really like a month list. Um, and when dealing with the time blindness and not really having a clear understanding, like how long things are actually going to be able to take and then putting yourself in a position with your organization or with your manager and thinking that like something that's going to take somebody five minutes is actually going to take me 35 minutes and not factoring that in. Um, 
And um, something else that comes up a lot too is just is addressing the emotional dysregulation that can happen with the ADHD ADHD years as well. And how do you how do you deal with that in the moments? And how do we do some mindset shifting and um, put in some other supports in order to help you move through your emotion your emotions at the time? Like, do you know what your emotions are? Do you know what your thoughts that are happening that are triggering those emotions? And, um, how do you know, like, are you aware and bringing some awareness into how your thoughts and emotions are impacting your actions? Um, because that in itself is a time suck. And so like, if you're experiencing something at work and it's causing some emotional dysregulation, your process to get through that, to get back on task needs to be accounted for when you're thinking about like how long a project is going to take. And so you're working. So for example, like you're working on a group project with three other people. One of those people pisses you off on a regular basis, um, <laughs> um, which, you know, which is what just happens in, in the work. Yeah, yeah. It's something that's just like super annoying. Right. And so then now you're completely just distracted by this particular behavior and now you're ruminating and now you're spending all the time and energy thinking about it and now you're chatting with another colleague about it and so all of that time has gone by and then now you're in like now you have 15 minutes in order to finish this project that you're supposed to be working on and so how do you get through that loop faster or how do you process those emotions faster so that you can get them fast and how do you do that because i'm quite intrigued now (laughs) 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 um and so what I have people do is really is um, there's a, I can't remember the name of the psychologist and I'll, I'll send it to you afterwards, but she has created this program called, um, or this method called steer mapping. And so it's S T E A R. And so it's your situation, your thoughts, your emotion, your um, action, and then your results. And so thinking about, and so when I, I have people do this, this exercise. And so thinking about like the situation, like your coworkers pissing you off, your thought is like, they're super annoying and why are they on this team? Um, and like, this is a waste of time. Like you're having all of these negative thoughts and then those negative thoughts are not getting you excited. So they're, they're driving some emotions that are not um, positive. And so now you're in this negative space and dealing with these emotions and, um, and it could even be like, go back to self-doubt, like, huh, why am I even on this team? Like you have starting to have these thoughts and you're questioning things. And so it's just leading emotions. It could be a self-doubt. It could be confusion. It could be annoyance. And then that's leading to inaction. It's either, usually it's inaction. Like I'm not doing anything. Um, and then which the result is like your initial goal is not being met. Right. And so like what's happening in that process And then, so then you, that's what's reality, what's happening. So then the second part of the exercise is to do it again, but do it backwards. And so thinking about like, what results do you want? Like, I want to get this done in the next 15 minutes. Yeah. What actions do I need to do in order to get this done? What emotions do I need to have in order to implement those actions? And what thoughts do I need to have in order to have those emotions about the same situation? And so it's a lot of mind shifting exercises that you can do to help move through your emotions and that's I just suppose all of, yeah and i suppose that some pause is required you need to pause first to realize that you are experiencing what you just described yes before you actually put anything into action don't you so yes. yeah because sometimes people describe with emotional dysregulation it goes from zero to 100 and they, they struggle to catch it it just happens instantly Situation happens, someone is annoying them, they get annoyed. Uh, response is thought pops into their head, you know, um, you know, why are you doing this to me? I don't like you, whatever, leading to some emotion. So it's, it's, um, I suppose it's a little practice that needs to go into this. Um, it's, it's not it like you do it once, yeah, yeah, you have to practice, but then this is why, also, like when I would say, when I say, like, you know, if you can access coaching, this is when one of those things it's like, okay, my, I'm all over the place, like, let me. Yeah. Externally process this with somebody else. Like, is there a coach on your team? Um, be able to do that. But like, you know, if businesses can't afford having a, somebody with um, coaching skills to come in to help support people, like this is yeah. where you can train your managers to be better coaches. Like, how do you train your managers to be coaches for your employees? 
Um, and they need to have ADHD themselves. Right. Yeah, that's another story. Yep. Yep. And so like, you know, if you have a manager that understands ADHD and then can practice some coaching and help move you through this process a little bit faster than, you know, then the manager is actually doing their job because of the whole point of having a manager is to help support people get tasks done. And so what that process looks like for somebody with ADHD is different. Yeah. I think the whole concept about management and things, sometimes it's, what I think about it is, I don't think the training itself to become a manager encompasses things like what you just mentioned about coaching, being tuned and all of the things that we've just covered there, which would be quite helpful because I think it, it might focus on strategy and, you know, team building and all of that stuff, which is obviously quite helpful, but certainly from a employee to an employee point of view on that level. And then you add the new diversity, understanding your employers, acting as their advocate, coach, all of that. It's something that obviously that's very quite important for, for them to be to be aware of as well, aren't they? Isn't it? Yeah. And you know, and I work with executive leaders too. And so like when I talk to these executive leaders, it's like I end up helping them better understand how to be a better coach. Um, I'm like, you're dealing with people, like you need to understand human behavior, like you need to understand neurodiversity, like you need to understand these things because you're working with people. And your whole point of your job, essentially, as a manager and as a leader is to get people to do things. And it's harder to be able to get people to do things if you don't understand who you're working with. And so, I mean, but you know, most yep. jobs, like people yep. get promoted to management positions all the time. Right. And so it's, it's never yep. about, um, it's just about how, oh, you can get this task completed. And so then now you can, you can better manage. And it's like, it's, it's two different jobs. Yeah. You touched on one uh, subject that we covered last a couple of weeks ago on uh, feeling burnt out. And I think it ties in nicely with uh, time management as well, where, you know, time estimation can cause you to find yourself um, working extra, extra hours or not being um, on top of your work, which can result in you feeling burnt out. Um, and I guess that's something you said that tends to come up in your practice as well from when you work with clients. Yeah, burnout, yeah, burnout comes up yeah. a lot too. And then, um, yeah. you know, I usually ask people like, are you also in a position where you're, you're maximizing your weaker executive functions and not spending enough time in your areas of strength? And, um, you know, I have all my clients do an executive function assessment and it's like, let's actually take a look at what you're, let's look at how your frontal lobe and how your brain works. What are your actual strengths? What are your areas of weakness? And like, and then take a look at your job, like, and are you spending a majority of your time at your job in your weaker executive functions? It's, you're going to be, wait, you're going to be spending so much more energy trying to, um, function than you would be if you were just operating in your strengths. And so you're going to feel more burnout that way. On, on the other flip side as well, it's about career. Again, I've discussed this in this podcast where choosing the right career that matches your skills, strengths, and all of that, which to some extent you kind of need some, some people need some guidance and maybe see a coach to be able to maybe highlight some of their strengths that might help them decide what career pathway they can go down. Yeah. And, but also on the flip side, the employer also really could be doing something differently in order, like how they write their position descriptions, for example, like it's not necessarily all about the task, but what skill sets do people need to have in order to complete, complete the work? Um, like, you know, some skills can be taught, right. But there are people that have particular strengths in the in the type of work and so how are you how are you structuring your hiring process how are you structuring your interview questions how are you structuring your overall like like how did you write your position descriptions in order to help people better understand the strengths that they need to have in order to t to do the job um and so you know people are like oh i just need somebody to do x y and z and it's like okay but what strengths do people what strengths somebody needs to have yeah. in order to, be able to do x y and z and um, being able to be to describe those and then to help support people better understand what it is that they need to have um is also helpful so it's it's both it's both ends for people that are fearful of disclosing the ADHD in the workplace what what advice would you give those people because i've come across people that say 
um, I might be treated unfairly or um, they might feel that I'm not suited for this job. All of those kind of things. So what, what advice would you give? Um, one, I mean, I hate to say it, but like there may be some truth into that. Like there may be some there. It may not be the right job for you. Um, and so there may be um, it may not be the right organizational culture for you. There may be some challenges. Um, there may be people that work there that are ignorant and that will treat you differently because of it. And so there's some reality to those fears. So one, you know, it's about validating that there there could potentially be some truth in that. Um, but at the same time, there also could be, it also could not be true. And so are you going through that process and, and asking yourself those questions? Like, am I actually in a work environment that would support my disclosure? Um, and that could be a yes and that's a yes or no question, but only only you're going to know that. And um, the other thing is like, you don't have to disclose at work in order to get accommodations. There's ways to go about it. But again, like you need to be, you know, back to my A's, like you need to be aware of how your ADHD is impacting your work. And regardless if you disclose or not, um, you may know, like if you know that you get really distracted, like then you can still talk to your employer, be like, hey, um, like I'm getting really distracted by all the noise in the hallway. Is there some other space within the office that I can go to that would be a little bit quieter? And like, you know, that's a, yeah. a normal question that anybody yeah. for anyone, honestly, like ADHD or not ADHD. Mm. Those four A's you mentioned, uh, <laughs> do you want to you wanna just tell, do you want to send them out again so that our listeners can make a note of them again? Sure. Awareness. Yeah. Acceptance. Accommodation. And action. Okay. All right. So do you want to break them down to us? So awareness of the ADHD and how it impacts on them? Yes. Awareness of your ADHD and how it impacts you. Awareness of the job that you're in. Awareness of your life and how all of these things interact. Um, okay. And then acceptance. You have to accept the fact that you have ADHD. Um, and because you're going to, you're not going to think of ways to accommodate or, or ways that you're not going to think about your needs if you're not accepting the fact that you have them. Um, and then, you know, those can go back and forth as well, like awareness and acceptance in terms of like what comes first, it's kind of like the chicken and the egg, right? And so um, do you accept yourself, your whole self, and then um, being able to ask for what it is that you need? Um, and then the other one is accommodations. And so, you know, that's, that leads to once you are aware and once you've accepted that this is just your reality, what accommodations and strategies can you put in place to help better support you? And so, you know, going back to awareness again, it's like, do you, are you aware of your weaker executive functions and what things you would need in order to accommodate those? And then action, like, do you have the skills and the, um, are you setting yourself up for success in order to put those actions in place? Um, and so like, I am aware that I experienced time blindness. I, because I've accepted the fact that I have ADHD um, and I have accepted the fact that I will probably be late unless I put in, <laughs> unless I put in particular strategies. And so like my accommodations is like, I have bought timers, like kitchen timers and I have kitchen yeah. timers all over the house. And, right. and I have decided that like I'm not going to try to guess how long something is going to take I'm just going to time myself and make note of it um and then and then use that data of myself in order to make better decisions um and then that action step is you know actually putting them like taking the timers and putting them everywhere I have one in the bathroom I have one in the kitchen I have one in my office I literally have them all over the, all over the house <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, and you yeah. know like that's one thing that I do at home and then like another thing I do at home is too is like you know when I think about my ADHD and I need visual reminders and like right now like for an example like we didn't talk about like you know parenting and parenting and having a newborn and motherhood but how many times have you left the house got to the car and been like you forgot like three things yeah. or like the one thing that you know that you cannot leave the house without like I'm like, oh, shoot, I forgot my wallet. Oh, shoot, I forgot my phone. Like, I need these things before I actually drive off, right? And so it's a whole other 
thing when you have a newborn with you when you're driving. And so yep. like, you get everything that the newborn needs. You have everything that you think that you need. Then you pack them in the car. You get in the car. Finally, this is like a whole feels like a whole workout. Then you get into the car and you're like, I forgot something. <laughs> And of course, <laughs> yeah. you and so, you know, now it's like a whole other level, right? And now it's, it's one thing <laughs> to by yourself and you forget things, but when you forget yeah. something, and then now you have to deal with a newborn and now you have to take him out of the car too. And now you have to go back inside the house. It's, yeah. it's a problem. And so like, you know, I have had to yeah. reevaluate some of my own strategies. <laughs> I bet. Um, <laughs> you, you, have you, know, you have to remember to take the... You have to remember to take the newborn baby with you as well. <laughs> right. And so like now, like, you know, one of the things that I always tell people like to do is like, I have painted my front door with whiteboard paint. Like my door is white anyway. So like the inside of the door is white. I've used whiteboard paint. And so like now I usually, I've only used it really for um, like if I'm going on a vacation or if I'm, if there's something that I really need to remember to like take with me when I leave at the house, I just put it on the front door. I literally write it on the front door with my markers. But now I'm like, okay, I need to, I need a checklist. Like I need a checklist for myself. That's literally on the front door. That's like keys, wallet, baby, diapers, like <laughs> bottle, yeah. like yeah. milk. And like the nipple to the milk, because I've left without, I've left with the milk, but I didn't have the nipple with it. And so I'm like, well, this is ineffective. Like, how is this going to work? <laughs> and so like, now <laughs> I have to create a whole new, a whole new checklist. Um, but like, these are the things, like if you're not aware of how your ADHD is impacting your day-to-day, -day, you're not going to be able to put in, you're not going to be able to put in these, these these strategies in place. And if you're not accepting it, you're like, you're just going to fight it. Like, Oh, I don't need this. Like, so when they, you know, you go to comparison land, it's like, well, Johnny down the street doesn't need this. So like my friend Sarah doesn't need this. So like, why do I need to put this in place? And it's like, because that person doesn't have ADHD and you do. And yeah. so here it is. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Cause I was going to ask you, obviously, I'm assuming first time parent as well. Yes. Yourself. Yeah, yeah. So the challenges that that brings becoming the new parent and you got ADHD, I think you just outlined it perfectly. Just as I was just as I said, I was just about to ask. Um, but it is, it is a shift and it, it's gonna test you, as you say. It's not just thinking about yourself, it's thinking about everything else, thinking about baby. And as you know, there's so much that goes with just having a newborn, particularly in this case, where packing, having to remember tons and tons of things. If you then go somewhere. For a long time imagine how much packing you then have to do and make sure you got everything there so um yeah, yeah. But i'm sure and yeah it's a lot and like and you know and i don't have this i don't have this experience now but it's something that i i think about and i know that like other people do have this experience it's like you know when you have time blindness and you have a newborn that you need to pick up from daycare like if you're leaving yeah and then in, in the states and i don't know if they do this in other places but daycare is here if you are five minutes late they, they charge you by the minute and so now you're like, okay, now I'm experiencing time blindness. I'm at the office. People are coming in and out. Like I haven't got stuff done. Like, oh, wait, I have to go pick up my child. And now I'm 10 minutes late. And now I have to pay all these extra fees. Like there's yeah. real impacts to this. Like there's impacts to your finances. Like kids are expensive in general. Yeah. But like now yeah. it's like a real impact to your finances now um, when you're experiencing time blindness in a way that didn't impact you before, before you had kids, if you're accessing daycare in that way. Yeah. So um, thanks for sharing your story as well. Um, and I think I'm sure some of our listeners that resonates some of the things you just mentioned there. Is there anything else you want to maybe just say, going back to the original topic we we're discussing on accommodations, workplace adjustments that we haven't discussed, maybe last last few things you want to sort of mention before we, we finish? Um, sure. I would say um, if you're not seeking supports, seek them. Um, you you're going to need them. And and that's just just that's just a reality. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to 
like, you know, knock on your manager's door tomorrow and say like, I have ADHD. And like, these are all the things that I need, but like, it may just start with let's doing some research, doing some research about um, what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, and then figuring out um, like who you can talk to around accommodations or what strategies may work for you. Um, and then, you know, and it may start with like talking with a friend, talking with somebody that you feel comfortable with and finding that person to be like, hey, can I just run this by you? Like, what do you think? And, um, you know, start to work up. If you don't, if you don't have that skill set yet, try to work up the ability to be able to advocate for your own, advocate for your own needs. Yes. Um, in that, yeah. In that yeah. And and this remembering one. those four four A's that you mentioned earlier as well. <laughs> yes. Um, four A's. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you know, always go to my website. I don't know. Um. Right now, my website yep. is up and I'm starting to blog a little bit more too. So right now I'm going through all of the different executive functions and how those different executive functions can impact you in the workplace. Um, and not just from your perspective as an employee, but also from the perspective of the employer and then thinking and then providing some suggestions on how to accommodate that from both ends. So we can meet in the middle because I don't think that the ADHD or should do all the work. No. Do you want to tell our listeners your website or contact details as well? Sure. It's adhdatwork.co is my website. Um, and then on social media, on IG and TikTok, but I'm not on TikTok as much as I probably could be. But on Instagram, it's also ADHD at work and it's AT at work. Okay. Do, um, you, uh, do you see clients from all over the world or just the U.S.? Nope, I see clients from all over the world. And so you, if you go on my website, you can also book a 20-minute free consultation. Um, and so the schedule is right on my website and you can just schedule, go ahead and schedule yourself. And then um, please, if you're going to schedule yourself, show up. So <laughs> I yeah. will add that. Please, if yeah. you're going to be using, utilizing my time, um, um, please um, show up for the appointment. So set a reminder. The Calendly will automatically remind you, but put it on your calendar, set an alarm, um, um, and I will provide you 20 minutes of my time. We can talk about um, why you're accessing and seeking coaching um, or if you're seeking some consulting services as well. If you are a business listening, also reach out to me and set up schedule some time to see how I can help support your organization be more inclusive. Um, I also am now doing a little bit of swag. And so I have, um, it wasn't, mailed in enough time for this podcast but um i um am setting up a store as well to promote products that support um people with adhd um and so right now i have a sweatshirt up it's persistent over consistent um because i believe in people being persistent and i think with adhd brain something we didn't really talk about is that we you know the, we, have a, we live in a or in a culture of like you need to be consistent you need to be consistent you need to be consistent but the reality is is like the adhd brain is not going to allow you to be that consistent and so like stop fighting it and so just be persistent um um and so that is available for sale as well wow and is that via your website um there will be a link to it on my website but right now it's actually in my Etsy store. Um, but I will send you all the links for the show notes. Amazing. Um, yeah, if I could get one in the post, that would be great. <laughs> to wait, do my <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Perfect. Great. There you go. <laughs> all right. Perfect. Good to see you, Megan. Okay. Bye. Take care. Bye.